My name is Brian Gothberg. I'm a new addition to the Be Connected training team. And this afternoon, I wanted to give you a short introduction to Google Drive, uh, just long enough to make it interesting and attractive to you. Uh, I hope you all enjoy it. It's not by accident or a transition that I decided to call this, and now, a short in intro to Google Drive. And, and now, are the two things to take away from this talk about why you should start tinkering with Google Drive and get used to it. I think it will really augment your productivity. First, the and. Microsoft Office is not going anywhere. Microsoft Office is still supported this year. It will be supported next year. There are no plans that anyone I know has heard of from Microsoft Office going away from the UC Berkeley campus. You still have Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, Microsoft PowerPoint, and Access, and all that if you wish to use it. You still have that full functionality. In addition to Microsoft Office, you have another set of tools. You have the applications that are in Google Drive. You'll be able to use both at your convenience as you see fit where they're applicable and where they're advantageous to you. Now, now is important because using Google Drive will make it easier for you to collaborate with other people and it will make those collaborations happen quicker and more efficiently. You'll, you'll be able to get more work done with less effort and less time. I have honestly only been on Google Drive for about five or six weeks and I have seen how it's transformed my work habits. I think Many of you might sympathize to the philosophy that you only have really started to truly learn a tool on the computer when it changes how you think about your work. In six weeks, Google Drive has very much changed how I think about my work. And I think it will for you too. <coughs> the most obvious features for the Google Drive suite is that it's um, not a clone, not a copy, it's a set of programs that have much of the functionality of Microsoft Office. If you wanted me to give a number, wanted for me to give a number, I might, I might say 60%, 70%. I think the programs in Google Drive are able to do the functions that 95% of us use our computers for, for 95% of the time. There are things that you can do in Microsoft Office you cannot do in Google Drive. However, Google Drive has other assets and features that I'm sure will intrigue you. Because Google Drive is based in the cloud, your software is always up to date, and so is the software that your coworkers are using. There's no more version conflicts, there's no more, uh, uh, no more department discussions about whether we'll be using Doc or DocX. That all goes away. The Microsoft Office documents, docs, spreadsheets, presentations, and the parallel files that you create in Google Drive can be mutually converted to one another and uploaded and downloaded. The conversions, for what, certainly when you get into higher level functions, for instance, uh, uh, obscure number crunching commands in Excel, the conversion may not be perfectly accurate, but for what I've tested so far, it's awfully good. I haven't found many failings. Using Google Drive, it's much harder to lose your work. Through misadventure or inattention or hardware failure, your work is accessible from any computer. You have the option, if you choose, <coughs> of setting up files on your local hard drive to keep live synchronization with files in your Google Drive. If you wish to do that, you could do that for all of your hard drive. Google Drive is constantly saving the work that you do in open files so that you don't have to. Of all the features, of all the impressive features, I, I count myself a rather a power user with Microsoft Office. I, I write macros, I do number crunching, I use styles in Word. For all the features that Google Drive has, the one 
that you will miss the most at first is the save command. There are a few special contexts in Google Drives where you can see a save command, but mostly it doesn't exist. There's no need for it because Google is constantly saving your work to the cloud. You go into, uh, go into a word processing document in Google Drive, you can sit there and type your heart out late into the night, and when you're done with the document, you simply close the window in your browser. It's been saved and saved and saved and saved, as far as I can tell, maybe 10 times a minute or more while you've been working on it. Do you have a quick question? Yes, this Google Drive can only be, uh, I'll repeat the question. The question was whether or not this takes place only when you're online. And the answer is not only do the constant reiterative saving operation perform, perform to save your file, save your work, not only does that only happen online, but in fact you can only use Google Drive while you're online. Something that would be worthwhile for me to make clear is that like, like Google Mail and Google Calendar, it's only accessible within a web browser. And as has, I think, been mentioned earlier today, the, the browser that will give you all the features and all the bells and whistles is Google Chrome. They have their own natural interest in promoting that. You can, uh, I commonly work using uh, the latest version of Firefox and the latest version of Safari on the Macintosh. I haven't, it hasn't been made obvious to me that I'm missing anything. I can, only, I can only see what I'm missing by going into Google Chrome. And I've heard from some sources that one should avoid using Internet Explorer. I haven't, in, ex in my own experience fooling around, I haven't seen any problems with using Internet Explorer. But I've heard that advice repeated. So bottom line, just as with Google Mail, just as with Google Calendar, you can only use the Google Drive apps while you're online in a browser program. Not only is Google Drive, oh, that went a little bit low. Not only is Google Drive constantly saving your work, it's constantly saving increments of your work, such that it's very, very easy to look through a history of your revisions and find any past version of what you were working on. If any of you saw uh, a popular movie from, what, 15 years ago, Shakespeare in Love, where, where he's, cooked, he's cooked up a great play, he's sure this is gonna make a big splash on the stage, and let's see, what, what's it called? It's called Romeo and Ethel, Princess of the Pirates. All right? Uh, that's it, thank you, thank you, thank you, Ian. Romeo and Ethel, the pirate's daughter, okay? So if you get to the point in your work where you say, gosh, two hours, two hours ago I had another name for Ethel, the pirate's daughter. What was I, and I got rid of that. What did I call that? You can just go back through your revision history until you find that special detail that you, that you may have deleted during the course of your work, during the course of your revisions. Because Google is constantly saving your work in small incremental slices, the task of version control and document control go away. I've worked in departments in the private sector where uh, connected with a large engineering project. There was a woman who had the job of document control and most of her job seemed to involve saying no with force. There, there, there is a big document with all the specs for a big construction project, and it goes to the guy who's in charge of electricity, and he's got that document on his desk Wednesday through Tuesday. And then she comes and retrieves the Xerox. This was, this was years ago. And uh, she comes and retrieves the Xerox, and then she takes it down the hall to Hank's office, where he's in charge of heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And if the guy who was making the, uh, making the updates on the electrical issues comes and says, wait a minute, there's something I've got to fix, Sharon would say, no, your time has passed. Now the document has walked down the hall to Hank. And that, that was her job. That's what document control used to look like. That becomes not a thing of the past. It's that Google Drive takes care of the document control for you. It makes it possible for you to retrieve any past version 
of what you've been working on. I've been told by people I've come to trust that these versions follow your document around for years. Did you get know the date? Yes. Well, pardon me. My understanding is that being extra data in the real world, certainly they take up space. However, in terms of your account and your allocation of space in the Google Drive environment, any and all work that you create using the native Google productivity suite, creating a document, which looks like a Microsoft Word file, creating a spreadsheet, which looks like a Microsoft Excel workbook, creating a slideshow presentation, which looks like a PowerPoint file, all of those are off the meter. They don't count against your allocation. As far as you choose to use the Google Drive environment, this is a slight detour here, as far as you choose to use the Google Drive environment like Dropbox, that does count against your allocation. You can upload to Google any kind of data file at all. I've, I've seen it repeated somewhere that the Google Drive environment is able to open commonly created files from something like 30 common applications, but you may, you may upload any piece of data you wish in a file, whether or not the Google Drive applications can read it, you are permitted to store it there in the cloud, in your account, and that will count against your 25 gig gigabyte allocation, but all work that you do in the native Google apps will not. You can just go to town. Uh, you have a question? Oh, okay. It's also much easier to share your work. Your work can be shared with as many collaborators as you wish at a variety of privilege levels. And we'll go into the privilege levels in depth. It's, uh, it's something that, that's very, very easy to use, and I think it'll be in the forefront of your attention very soon. Because you're actually sharing one document, which is your original, that you created. The need for attachments starts to go away. In our training groups, sometimes people have been seen in the hallways wearing buttons that say, I have attachment issues. Because we're all getting used to the idea that, that doing business and getting work done by making copies of our work that clutter up our friends' hard drives and their work cluttering up our own, the need for that is starting to expire and become obsolete. You can just go ahead and do the work in one document and share it with your collaborators. And there is, and, and in, the simplest, in the simplest case, without, without any complications, real life always has complications, but in the simplest case, you don't need to, make it, you don't need to send out attachments which become copies in other people's hard drives. You don't need to make copies for different versions of the document because, as I mentioned and I'll show you, Google saves very finely sliced images of what your work has been. You, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's an animation student at an art college somewhere who's figuring out how to do, how to create an animated film from Google's document history because it is so finely sliced. And that's, and that's the now that I emphasized, is that everything happens more quickly and more efficiently because instead of sending attachments around town, waiting for them to come back with, with, people's, uh, with people's work on them, perhaps with comments, you can share with everyone at the level of access that you choose one document right now. And, and if you give them sufficient privileges, they can interact with that document and comment on it or even alter it directly. And you're not worried about that because you can always rewind the film back to an earlier edition of your document. If you send things out to a bunch of collaborators and you discover that they're actually a bunch of chimpanzees and they made bad contributions, you just rewind the document back to the point before they started to mess with it. Did I see a question? Does it allow conversion to PDF? Yes, it does. 
Yes, it does. Handles, handles PDFs very well. And so in summary, we can all be working on the same piece of work, adding to it collaboratively, seeing what other people are doing. Again, going back to this issue of document control. You can imagine some piece of work which needs input from a number of people. And that might be sent around to a number of people sequentially. Or, worst case scenario, de depending on the work and the situation, use your imagination, it might be sent out to five or 10 people simultaneously. And then when all the comments and alterations come back, then there's some poor sod who locks themselves up for three days, reconciling all those different contributions. And there may be conflicts. Jim says it has to be this way, and Linda says it has to be that way. And well, which way should it be? And how can we reconcile these two different things? With Google Drive, they can actually see their contributions and their changes to that original live and in real time when they're happening. Now, this, the, the, this, is, uh, this is sort of like 30 years ago, the old Bill Cosby commercials for a computer. You know, and you can balance your checkbook. Well, really, the thing that makes your checkbook balance is showing restraint at the supermarket. Okay? But this will help you with the math. If you have a conflict between your collaborators, I'm sorry to tell you, Google Drive will not resolve that conflict. But it will make it less of a chore to see that conflict and, uh, and have the evidence presented in front of you so that you can start to figure out how it will be resolved. There we go. This presentation, in fact, is a, is a Google Drive document created with their version of PowerPoint. And uh, this is about the third presentation I've cooked up using this tool. I find it does most of the things that PowerPoint does. You can see up at the top of, uh, up at the top here, we have a menu bar. And as I click on menu headings in turn, you can see that it's a lot of the same things that you're used to seeing in PowerPoint. If I had, well, as a live demo, let's see here, as a short, why can't I, there we go, as a short, snappy intro to Google Drive. Now I've made an alteration to my file, and up here at the top of the browser window, I'm closing the tab, it's been saved. If I, well, I, I shall reopen it. Here under the file menu, there's no save option. I can make a new one, I can open one, I can rename, I can make a copy, as you see fourth one down here. But I can't, I can't save because Google's taken care of that already. Are there any questions before I go further? Let's carry on. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Oh, and here's the mic. How often does the save happen? By my experience, and I think we'll be able to do a successful demo right here, by my experience, it's many times a minute. Okay. Uh, this asks from unfortunate experience with supporting. With autosave, for example, in Microsoft Office? Yes. Uh, the answer would be many times a minute, perhaps. Off, off the cuff, maybe 10 times a minute. Is there a feature comparable to track changes? Yes. There's a, let me say it more cleanly. There is a feature which does the job the track changes does better. And that is the revision history, which, which, we, which we will go to later on in the presentation. And you will see all the different incremental incrementally altered versions of a file laid out for us to find. I, I, am a, I think of myself as a skilled user of track changes. Track changes has done a lot of good work for me over the years. And I think this is much more intuitive to use and easier. Did I see one more? We'll continue. 
Oh. Uh, document control usually means one person can, like you were describing, can change it at once. Right. Somebody, one person has authority to change it at one time. Right. How, how is that handled? I, I will come to that. The short answer is easily, thank you. It's very, it's very easy to do. And, and I'll, I will demonstrate that later. So I'm still getting used to this Mac. I'm not sure what it's complaining about there. This is your Google Drive desktop with your work in it. You can see my own work. This is my own account, as you should be used to by now in the Google environment. You can see my logon ID up here in the upper right corner. And front and center, we have in front of us a directory listing, much like a directory listing that you could see online or in uh, Windows or on a Macintosh. These are icons for folders, which I have defined to break up my work into more easily conceivable chunks. And here, let's see, what's a benign place? I'll keep it over here. And here you can see icons for different things that, are, that I have stored in B Drive right now. One of these is the very first one that says QTAT presentation 2012, September 19th. That is actually an uploaded PDF that was, that was not created in any way or, or form connected with uh, B Drive, with Google Drive. Here is a spreadsheet. You can see the green spreadsheet icon, the data validation test. Here is a form. You can do, you can very quickly and easily create forms to do the same kind of job that you might have gone online to SurveyMonkey for. It's very easy to create a form and send it out to people or make it available on a website and gather information about almost any topic at all. Forms and spreadsheets are very intimately tied to one another because all the data from a form immediately pours into a spreadsheet. And we will do a demonstration of that later as well. Here the blue icon is a word processing document. And here I, I think this is, uh, this is quaint that the icon for a presentation is actually a red cardboard 35 millimeter slide frame. <laughs> Like, like, like previous generations of teachers used in public demonstrations. You can see next to some of these files that they're marked as shared. And that's exactly what they are. I've gone through the steps to share them with other people. The owner for all of these is marked as me. Because the directory that we're looking at here are all files of which I am the owner which is almost synonymous with creator. The, the, author, the author of a file starts off as the owner. That is a unique status. It, it can only be held by one person in the Googleverse. It can be reassigned. You can create something and then hand it off to someone else, and then they have all the ultimate authorities, in, including the one privilege that an owner has that no one else has, which is to delete the file. Only the owner may delete it. You may share it far and wide. You may share it to only a select few. And you have all sorts of choices about how it's shared and how those people that it's shared with can interact with it, or perhaps not interact with it at all. But only the owner may delete the file. Here in the right-hand column, you can see the dates at which they were last modified. Over here, oh. I should also cover these column headings, which give you more sort options. Which ones were last modified? The column that's being sorted on is marked in red. Right now it's last modified. I'm going to resort by title. Over here to the left, Let's spend a few minutes taking a look at the left-hand navigation bar. The most obvious things to see are the red buttons. Do a little bit of hovering. Well, create speaks for itself. And the one next to it is upload. This is the button you would use to upload a file from your local hard drive. 
into your Google Drive desktop. Create is where you begin your work. If I click on Create, I can create a document, much like something you would create in Word, a presentation, like PowerPoint, a spreadsheet, like Excel, a form, which you could think of as a special feature of a spreadsheet. Any spreadsheet may have a form. All forms always have spreadsheets attached to them. And a drawing, which we really won't go into in this presentation. Here I can also create a new folder at this level in my folder tree. I can also create a script. I don't write JavaScript, so I, I try to stay away from that one and not say anything bad. You can also select a template. To say a few words about that, well, actually, let's click on it. You can see this open up a new tab in my browser. Let's see if I can get anything. Ah, let's go to public templates. In a way, this is comparable to uh, getting involved with labs in calendar. Templates are very comparable to a template that you would create in the Microsoft Office environment where you have a document or a form or a presentation that you want to keep using over and over again for different projects, oh, like a departmental letterhead stored in a Microsoft Word document. You can publicly store templates or store templates just for UC Berkeley or store your own templates simply for your own use. And if you've never used templates before, I recommend trying it. It can save a lot of work. We'll just close that tab and go back to our desktop. Going back to the left-hand navigation bar, I can also do a filter on items that have been starred. The stars work just the same way as they do in uh, Google Mail. And it's, it's really an, an ad hoc personal purpose flag, like, uh, like a flag or a pin, that you can stick on any item for your own purposes to mark it for something you'll come back later or whatever you want. And if I filter for starred, now I'm just seeing the items that I've starred in my different directories. I can also look at the more recent ones. Here under more, I can sort by a I can filter by activity. And down here, under owner, and type, and more, are filters for the major file types. I can also sort by the classes of visibility that things have, because you can create things in the Google environment that are private to you and not shared with anyone. <coughs> or you can create things which are automatically available to other people at UC Berkeley if they search for them. Or if you choose, you can create something that could be found with a Google search by anyone on the planet. You can also here filter by ownership. Are there any questions at this point? Let's continue. I would also like to highlight that, like mail, like calendar, you have all the power of Google search commands here. And this is not, this is not just searching for file names in your Google Drive environment. You can also do content searches deep within the work that you've created using the same rules that you use online for a Google search on the web. Now, for a database project that I've been working on recently, I wanted some test data to screw around with. And I invented a spreadsheet of 3,000 UC Berkeley employees. Well, pretend employees. These are actually the 3,000 members of the cast and crew of the film Avatar. I copied their names off of the internet movie database. <laughs> now, I thought they're, they're probably as good as most of the people I know at Berkeley. And so I put, the, put all their names into a spreadsheet and used a random number generator to make uh, random phone numbers and stuff like that, just something to tinker around with. 
So if I do a search using quote marks for a phrase, the same way that we would on the internet, let's see. Let's start off not using the quotes. Let's see what happens if I just search for two separate words. You'll see my typing capability has gone out the window. There we go. We're searching on two separate words, Sigourney and Smith. And it does find my spreadsheet, because certainly Sigourney Weaver must be listed somewhere in those 3,000 lines. And certainly there must be a fellow or a woman named Smith. If I put quotes around that to mark it as a phrase, that we need to see those two words together in that order, it comes up empty. None of my Google Docs have the phrase Sigourney Smith. Then, of course, I can go ahead and hit pay dirt again and make that Sigourney Weaver, and I get the avatar list once again. It's a very powerful content search. Now, I, haven't, I haven't seen a content search on a, well, on, on a Windows machine or a Mac that can do as well. I'd like to go into the, well, oh, I'm sorry. Continuing with the left-hand, oh, I'm, you have a question. Yeah. Um, oh, just a moment. We'll get the microphone to you. So you're within Drive, so it only searches within Drive and not the world. You can, you can also do a search in the world. I mean, but, but that's how you've configured right. it here. How, that's what I've shown here. How, how is it restricted? It's only restricted by the fact that I'm on my Drive desktop and I entered the search in the field here. It's, that's automatically designated as a search through the contents of my Drive desktop, not out into the world. I think, you can see here as I start to modify the search, it's giving me the option down below to expand. Now it's, it's not. That, that search only, uh, this search box only searches docs. If you want to, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> This search box only searches docs. If you want to search uh, the rest of the world, you just have to go to www.google.com. And I, pardon me. I remembered that was somewhere nearby. Oh, you mean use here? Use this to. Yeah, you can refine it, but it, you can refine it. But I it's still see. Still only within docs. You can limit it down to within specific docs, but it's still that search box still only searches within docs. Okay. Yeah, if you want to search the world, then go out there to Google. Then you just and go to another world. tab. Yeah. It says UC Berkeley search. You can search UC Berkeley. Yes, so yes. you could oh, no, no, that's, that's Google Docs that are within the UC Berkeley right. Google Docs space. Right. All all of my co Berkeley under UC Berkeley. All, yeah, well because one of the sharing options when you share stuff in Google Docs is you can say share it with everybody inside UC Berkeley. Okay. And so that's what that is. Sure. Yeah, you, you know, so you can say share this with everybody inside UC Berkeley in a minute. Sorry to. No, no, no. You're, you, 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 over and over, you're a very useful person to know, Ian. Uh, as a matter of fact, would you, would you give him the microphone and, and, and let him introduce himself for our, our audio radiance, our, our listening audience? Uh, my name's Ian Crew. I am a member of the Google Project team uh, doing you know, various tech stuff for the team. I also uh, manage or uh, am the technical person behind uh, Surface here on campus called the Research Hub. Thank you, Ian. So far, I've just been showing you files that, were cre that I have created, stored in my Google Drive desktop. I'm going to collapse my folder structure here by clicking on the disclosure arrow and move down to the second line here and, and the second directory that I have access to. These are really two exclusive directories, my drive contains the files which I, which I am the owner of, and most of those typically will be ones that I created, shared with me. This is all the work that other people have shared with me for all sorts of purposes. 
We're using the same system of icons here to identify which kinds of files go to which kinds of work. You can also see icons here that don't belong to any of the native Google apps, although they're supported by Google. Here, this red one, if you can see it, looks like a little movie clapboard, like they would use on a soundstage. This is an MP4 file, and this plays a movie. You can also see down here, there's a piece of data called dept.uids, and it just gets a generic icon, but you can successfully store it in your B drive desktop. Up at the top here, you can even see a shared folder it's modified from the conventional folder icon with a little white outline of a stick person, you can not only share, let me say this another way, in a single action, not only can you share a particular file, such as a document or a spreadsheet, in a single action, you may share an entire folder. And you may pick particular levels of privileges for access to that folder. And that's a very powerful thing to use because then if you move something to that folder, unless you specifically specify different for that new file, it will be shared out to the same list of people at the same level of privileges. Let's go back Now that we're back in my drive, let's look in depth. Well, I, sh I should stop. Does anyone have any other questions? Yes. Oh, let let's wait for the microphone. Can you share documents with other people that somebody else has initially shared with you? Yes. That, that's a, a preference. Uh, you know, when, when you create a document, you can share it out to other people and you can choose whether or not you want to allow those other people to share it on farther. Yes, you do, you do have some control over how widely it is distributed. For, for instance, you could, mark it, you could mark it essentially as for UC Berkeley consumption only. Um, just uh, the ownership issue of uh, who, if uh, an employee leaves, the how are ownership kind of issues resolved and uh, like changing ownership to a private Google account and things like that? It is, uh, like I mentioned before, it is possible, and I know I'll get a sign from Ian if I get this wrong, it is possible to reassign ownership, and that is, that is a unique status. There can be only one user who is the owner, and Nat naturally, we, uh, we would want people who are being separated from the department to be on good terms and cooperative and, so, and help so, that happen. Yeah, um, more generally, um, we are just, uh, well, actually the first um, internal meeting about it is this Friday, uh, starting to think about um, not just for Google Drive, but uh, for content management on campus more generally. So for things like the Research Hub or CalShare or you know, uh, various other ones, how do, how do we do the right thing in terms of uh, reassigning ownership as people leave and uh, thinking about uh, how, what that process should look like, how it should be managed, uh, all that sort of thing. So. Uh, about all I have to say about it at this point is we are, we are very aware that it's a problem and that we're um, starting work on figuring out how to, how to best do that and do it in a way that uh, where you all or we all don't have to remember, wait, okay, if I'm on Google Drive, this happens, and then if I'm on CalShare, that other thing happens, and so we're trying to get some, some sanity there. I, I'm sure that many of the same brain cells and neuron pathways will be activated as were in use 30 years ago when we started to realize that most of people's important work was no longer going into file drawers with locks on them, but it was instead going onto hard drives or, or, or department servers. So let's start some monkey business here. Let's look at sharing documents. Now I want to 
I want to show you a lot about how documents are shared and how you accomplish that. And I am going to show you the mechanics of how to share with people in detail. But first, I would just like to show you where that window is and what it looks like. And then we'll do some real sharing. I'm hoping to whet your appetites, and then we'll get into the details. I think I see an, another question. Should we send the microphone to you? Uh, back there? I guess not. My mistake. So I have shared with, I guess, about 40 of my closest friends a Google Drive document that has the lyrics to Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. But can I have a show of hands for who has that on their machine right now? That's terrific. That's terrific. Let me go into my folder for Google Dive. Google Guides demo. And you can see here in the directory listing, Sgt. Pepper Lyrics is marked as shared. Here under File, so it's the very first item under the very first menu, this is the dialog box where we control how things are shared. And it has a lot of great tools. You can see up at the top, it provides you with the URL for a link to the document. It has a list of who has access to the document, starting with me, Brian Gothberg. And then we go on. I'm not sure if this was ordered. Uh, I'm guessing this. Uh, I don't know if this is ordered alphabetically by email. But by sliding through this list, it has all the people that I sent this to. Down here is the field where I can add people. Here, person by person, I can pick privileges. And if I chose, reassign ownership. I'm the only one who can reassign ownership because right now I'm the owner. You cannot go to a, shared, a document that someone else has shared with you and reassign ownership to yourself. Only the person who is currently the owner can do that. And finally here, here we can control levels of access connecting your document with the outside world. Is it public on the web and, and findable through a Google search? Or the antonym, the opposite of that, would be down at the bottom here, the default. For everything that you create in your Google Drive environment, the default is private. It's only yours. It's shared with no one. And it cannot be found by a Google search. It's private only to you. We'll come back to this, but next, let's see what sharing can do. Will everyone who is here in Sgt. Pepper's lyrics please put their cursor somewhere in the top two stanzas of the lyrics? We can see up here in the upper right corner a number of colored flags. These are coded for the different users. And as I hover my cursor over each one, you can see a different logon ID come up. We can even expand that view to make it a little bit easier. And you can see the colored cursors, like, like little colored ants, moving around the document. If I hover over one, I'll see the logon ID for that person. So please, feel free to uh, modify the lyrics and update them. Because, you know, like the Constitution, you know, Sgt. Pepper was written in a different time, and we need to upgrade it to a time of computers. And it was uh, 44 years ago today, Sgt. Pepper taught the band to play. I'm counting on all of you to, uh, to get in here and monkey around with the lyrics and make some changes. Will there be a sing-along? There will, there will be a sing-along as soon as Billy Shears arrives. Uh, oh, it's saw Meow. I see we have a cat fans here. Guaranteed, that's just flowery language. We can change that to sure. They're sure to raise a smile. Uh, Sergeant Pepper has been advanced to Colonel Pepper. So we've, uh, we've messed around with the lyrics here a little bit. And you can see how all of us who have been, all of you have had this document shared with you at the highest level of privilege. 
Well, right away, the, the trivial case is you can see you can view the document. If I had chosen to give all of you only the view level of privilege, something interesting has happened. Essentially, I would have done the same job as sharing a PDF with you without sending 20 or 40 copies of a PDF around town. You can see where attachments start to become obsolete. If I want to do the equivalent of share a document with people, but not permit them to alter the document, I would have shared this with all of you at a view only level of privilege. I actually shared it with each of you at the highest level of privilege, which permits you to go in and make edits. In between having permission to only view and having permission to make edits, in the documents, that is to say the files you create, which are much like a, a word processing document, like a Microsoft Word document, there is an intermediary permission, which is comments. This would be like what you would do if you had a four or $500 copy of Adobe Acrobat Pro, which enables you to receive a PDF and put comments into the PDF itself. So I like, I like the enthusiasm here shown by the word yeah. So I'm selecting that. Go to insert a comment. I'm going to slide to the right here because my screen is artificially narrow to accommodate the projector. I appreciate your enthusiasm. And now that's a comment on the document. Would all of you please do a comment? Select part of the document. You can, it, uh, if you do not select a word or a passage, the comment will be attached to where your cursor is now. And we should be able to see each other's comments show up. Um, uh, right click and, and bring up comment. A little in, in the page uh, menu. Do a right click on the page. Uh, select the word and then right click and the menu comes oh, right see. in the page. To create the comment itself. Yeah. Very good. So at that level of access, people can go in and make comments, again, on the same document in real time. Yes? What is visually oh. tying? We'll wait for the microphone. Thanks. Sorry. What is visually tying those comments to the particular word that they're referring to? If we click on a comment, you notice I did this one on, based on the word taught, and that is turned orange. There are other selections on there, but there's only one that's orange. And you can see if I switch which comment I've marked, I'm going to go back and forth between a couple of comments. And you can see, you can see the highlighting moving between different words. So this makes it possible to do a wide variety of work in a wide variety of settings, live, looking at the work itself, watching the work be changed by your collaborators, and even off on the side, having meta conversations and comments about what's being done. I think, I think this looks like a great way to have meetings. Let's look at, oh, yes. Thank you, Ian. Uh, one thing that we've done very successfully at times, just as a tip, is uh, when we've had a uh, phone conference, you know, a bunch of people dialing in from a bunch of different locations, we've at the same time opened a Google Doc that everybody logs into and used that instead of the whiteboard in the meeting room. 
And that works really nicely because then everybody at all the different locations on the phone conference can see and contribute to essentially a common whiteboard and you have a record of it at the end of the meeting automatically, no need to type up the notes. Yes, that's, that's exactly how this is going to impact work in a big way is that it makes it very, very possible to do a meeting with many people and we're not blowing all the bandwidth on faces and voices. It's all about the work and what we're doing with the work and in comments what we're saying about the work. But let's say that I've come to this late in the game and I'm overcome with horror at the idea that you all have revised the sacrosanct lyrics to Sergeant Power. Really, people, I'm, I'm appalled at you. Let's look at the revision history. Now, remember I had a question from uh, my right side of the room. How often is Google doing these saves? Well, here's what it looked like in one fi at 1.53 after the person with the ID well, I won't read it out loud for our listening audience, but you can, you can see here the person with the, uh, the, uh, the brick-colored deep red tag made some alterations. At 152, the person with the brick-colored tag and the person with the red tag made those alterations. At 152, 152, 150, and we just keep going. As we click on each of these little panels, we're taken back to another incrementally changed edition of the same document. And again, I'd like to repeat that the information, best information I have is that these revision histories attach to the document and follow it for years. It's not a transitory thing. This is a very, very, very serious tool for keeping track of work. Oh, just a moment, let's get the microphone. I have several questions I want to ask you later like this. Is this open to discovery then? Legal discovery? A lot of the things, questions I have, have to do with that. Because that would be, I can imagine, real disasters for the university. And I'm really serious. I do, I do not know. I, I am not an expert on legal discovery or on security matters. I do know that with shared documents, one, th one, thing, that this does, uh, one thing this does away with, uh, I, I actually have uh, granddaughters who are using Google, Do uh, Google Docs are a required tool at their high school. It rather does away with the matter of the dog eating the homework because then we simply rewind in time to before the dog got his teeth around it. Uh, it, also, uh, it also rather undoes the premise that I stayed up all night finishing this, uh, or, or pardon me, it undoes the premise that I've been working for six weeks on this paper on Moby Dick, whereas the revision history actually shows that it was all done in four hours of frenzied writing last night. We have another question. It's a comment on that. I, I don't, I know if I asked a similar question at the, when they were getting uh, the Berkeley Gmail going and, and they had gotten a higher level of privacy for the email than Regular right. Google That's Mail. That's my has, understanding. So, so I'm not sure what I would talk to security. It's not relevant to legal discovery. Yeah. Right. With regard to the question of how much of this information might be discoverable, we'll take that back to the privacy and security group. And typically, issues of discoverability in a legal case um, are, are decisions for attorneys. And so all documents and all revisions would, in a case where um, information were subpoenaed, let's say, would have to be evaluated um, by an attorney. Um, that's not uncommon, by the way. It's called e-discovery. It's a whole field of work um, um, in the world today. And I would imagine that in 2012, it's still evolving. Oh, yes. And could, just going back to the conversation that we're having with mail, though, the, what we were, what I was saying at that time is within the be connected environment, which is private to the university as opposed to the public Google space, 
that means that Google cannot come in and look at our documents and see, wow, they're talking about Sergeant Pepper. So when you are out in the web world, we're going to serve you all kinds of ads about buying Beatles products. That's the kind of protection and privacy that being within the Be Connected space affords. Right. Google, uh, Google for our, our little Berkeley bubble of Google, I hope that metaphor is clear, our little Berkeley bubble of Google, that sounds nice, which involves what we are branding as B-Mail, B-Cal, and eventually I understand that Drive will be called B-Drive. Google is not permitted to do data mining on the Berkeley materials in the Berkeley bubble. Let's look at another example of how we can share work collaboratively. I've also shared with everyone a simple spreadsheet called squares. There's really nothing exciting here, calculating the squares and square roots of the first 10 numbers. Can everyone else go ahead, at, who has access on, on their machine here in the room, would you please go ahead and view the squares spreadsheet and start tinkering with it? And we should be able to see where you're working in a way that's similar to what we saw in the word processing document. I can see I've got three other users over here. Very much like the word processing document, you can see what's going on in real time. And instead of seeing a little cursor moving about, you're seeing a selected cell with a color band around it. In the same way, this is uniquely identifying the different collaborators who are sharing the document right now and tinkering with it. Thank you all for that participation. I'll be calling on you one more time in a minute or so. All spreadsheets have the capability of using a form. You can create a form which you can give people access to either by the sharing mechanism or by an email or through a URL link that's placed on a website or URL that's applied to them that they can link to. And it's really this easy. Go to Tools and say Create a Form. Up here is the default title of my form, which is Squares. Here is a field where I can put in information about how to fill out this form or what it's about or what I want you to be paying attention to. And then down below, I can start to create questions which users will fill out online. Here's a space for a question title. Here I can type in text to supplement the title of the question and give you a clearer idea of what I'm asking from you. And then the question type. You can have text fields, both small and large, drop-down menus, radio buttons, and check boxes. And even a, a setting that I haven't seen before called a grid, which is a way of doing a lot of radio buttons together. You can, for any particular question, you can specify that it's marked as a required question by checking this box. So I'll just fill in something here. And then done. The form window automatically gives you a second question as a default that you can tinker with. And then after that point, you can go up to the upper left corner and click on Add Item and keep adding as many questions as you like. Not only can you do this after you've put information into the worksheet, you can do it while the worksheet is open and people are putting stuff in. Now, if, if you're going to create a database that you're going to have some control over, I recommend that you do it while your collaborators are out 
but that's to give you an idea of how flexible and forgiving it is at creating this interaction between a form that people will fill out and the spreadsheet that holds all the work. For those of you who have your machines with you in the room today, the second email that I sent you contains a form in the email. I'm going to go into that form, the potluck sign up. Rather, I'm in the worksheet that supports the form. If all of you would go to that form and fill in some answers and click the submit button at the bottom of the online form. And if everything works and the creek don't rise, we should see this worksheet start to be populated with your answers. Or unless Ian can give me a good reason why it shouldn't be. So, uh, sorry, I, I, I sorry. Did, oh, didn't mean to catch you unawares. No. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it'll come in. Uh, the question is if it would come in. Uh, unless you can think of a reason why, why it wouldn't. I mean, I, I had tested this. Yeah, no, it, it'll, it'll come in live as people will submit it if you mm -hmm. want to sit and watch it. Um, <laughs> Right. Response to the form, mm -hmm. so you get updated, so you don't have to go back and check it all the time. Right, right. I am going to adjust the alignment here for aesthetic reasons, so that everything goes to the top of the cell. <coughs> there we go. So you can see the information is coming into the worksheet live. Mm -hmm. and of course, we can adjust column width as we choose to make uh, make parts of this more readable. You'll notice, because uh, for our, uh, our non-computing and our listening audience, the fields on the form are for a, uh, people to submit their, uh, uh, submit their entries for the dish that they'll bring to a potluck luncheon for the department. And I ask them for, what's the dish you'll bring? Does it need any special equipment? And how will it be served, hot, cold, or at room temperature? Our worksheet has two additional fields. It has a timestamp which automatically comes in as a field on all forms. I honestly, I don't want to turn it off. I honestly don't know if it can be turned off. You get a timestamp with each entry. And there's also a checkbox for asking the, uh, asking the form to automatically plug in the Google logon ID of the Berkeley user. If it's something that's going out only to people at Berkeley, you could create a form which was used by people outside of Berkeley or in and out. But for those that are used within, you can ask the form to automatically bring in their login ID to identify them. This is such a terrific tool for gathering data quickly. I've already built a, uh, built a small database that's in use somewhere on campus right now. And they found this as a, uh, a terrific tool for serving customers over the phone and getting customers to uh, part getting uh, people who had problems calling into that department to log in online and give their contact, uh, contact information and some information about their problem. And then a representative got back to them. Uh, we have a question over here. Can you also add columns for additional data that you want to put in that isn't supplied by the form so you can give like yes. a status update or something? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And that's, uh, I proved this in the field with, uh, with uh, the little project that I built a couple of weeks ago is that uh, we had, had a situation where we wanted to make a log for phone reps to use. And after building the form, and then the form lays out the spreadsheet as you see it here, and then for fields that would be filled in in the office by the reps, we just went ahead and inserted columns wherever we wanted them, and those could be filled in manually. Excellent, thank you. I'm gonna run with that on the, uh, the added functionality of the spreadsheet. Just like with calendar, there is the equivalent of labs that you can go to for added functionality. So something that I had use for in this context, because this was about people with problems 
calling up, uh, re requesting a contact from UC Berkeley and identifying themselves. And then we also wanted to track the contact that the reps had with those people talking with them about their problems. We wanted to have an easy way for a timestamp. The Google spreadsheet follows Excel so closely that it keeps the hotkey combination that will create a date, create the now date in a cell, or create the time, but not the two of them together as a full timestamp. And so, noodling around, I went to the script gallery, go to the category of calendars and schedules, <laughs> This is just like a lab in Google Calendar. Insert date. The description says quickly add the current date, time, or date and time to a cell's value. Let's just do this live. Click the install button. Now it's installed. A disclaimer window comes up. I've authorized it. Now I can run the script. And what it gets me in my spreadsheet Notice there's a new item on the menu bar. Format, data, tools, form, nine, indicating nine entries, help, and now insert date. So I click on a cell. I have a new drop-down menu that does not exist in Excel. And it, did not and it did not exist in Google Docs in the Google Drive programs by itself. It's an added piece of JavaScript. So I go to insert date and time. It's working. Slight pause here. It's too bad we can't cue a short musical interlude. Script. OK. There had to be one eventually. We, we, we've, all made, we've all made it past 2 o'clock in the day. We've done pretty good. Script insert date and time experience an error. Dismiss. OK, so it had a problem. I'll try it a second time. See if that surpasses it. There we go. And there's a true timestamp. There's all sorts of added functionality can be added to a spreadsheet in the script gallery. This is another one of the real assets that the Google Drive applications have over Microsoft Office. I will still keep using Microsoft Office, but there is some real power hidden in these new scripts that you can add functionality to your spreadsheet. And I believe this would be a good time for qu questions, since we have a hand up. In regular spreadsheets, I can do like Control F and search for something. Yes. Can I do Control F and search for something here? I imagine it's Control F. I haven't, I haven't learned my keyboard shortcuts yet, but I know I will. So here is find and replace. I don't know if there's a, let's see, is there a keyboard shortcut indicated for that? You can try and press Command F and see what happens. Pardon? Command F? Try Command F and see what happens. Let's see what we get. Oh, no, that's, uh, that's within the browser, the browser itself, right. So uh, there, is, there is now a browser generated search field in the upper right corner of the screen. But that comes from Safari. That's not coming from Google. Can you embed that form on a standard web page? Yes. Let's go to, here we go, embed form in a web page. This code here, this is an iframe HTML code. If you take the selected code here in the middle of the screen and just copy and paste it into the HTML code for a page, then there will be a little window which has the form within it and a scroll bar on the side if, if the form is, runs deeper than the size of this window. And they can scroll upwards and downwards through the form. If you wish. You can also use the URL that's embedded within that command, starting with HTTPS. Between the quote marks, way out at the far right end, there's a closing quote. You can take that URL 
And you can also use that as a link anywhere on the web page that you would like. And then you simply come up with a rather unadorned different web page on the internet that has that form on it. To my knowledge, there is not a way, or I should say there's not a way yet, to put graphics or decorations or images on the form. Are there any other questions? I think that concludes the programmed part of my presentation. I think that's everything I have to show you today. Uh, thank you for your attention, and thanks to those of you who participated. Thank you.